Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in to Chess24. My name is Tex de Witt, I'm a feeder master from the Netherlands and next to me is Jan Gustafsson, famous grandmaster from Germany. World one famous. World famous, one of the key players, the key player behind Chess24. Is that too much honor? No, no right. I think that's fair to say. It's fair to say and we're here to uh, discuss the games from round three in the Sinkerfield Cup, the tournament that nobody probably missed. All chess players around the world love, love it when just eight or ten of the strongest chess players come together, right? I like it, yeah, with eight or... How many players are there? Ten players. Ten players? Eight from the top gonna, ten? I was gonna make a joke, we have here. Yeah, nine of the world's top players and Anish Giri, but it feels wrong, like, I can't do it. And who would you pick out of exactly. the ten? Because they're yeah. all world-class players. So we'll be looking at the games and we'll look ahead to the pairings of uh, tonight. I say tonight because in Europe it's tonight, in the United States it's in this afternoon. Uh, exciting round or calm, calm round? How would you describe it? A bit calmish. There were, well, still two decided games, which is, uh, well, not a lot, but it's average at this level, so there was some action going on and was a bit common than usual because there were a lot of end games not a lot of fireworks i would say mm -hmm. it's like watching a season of game of thrones and it starts out very well and then you have a bit of a downer yeah. in the middle and then the final episodes are great again so i think that's what it's like work up to the season finale again yeah, yeah it's absolutely. like game of thrones with less dragons less nudity but more what 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 what's better about chess compared to game of thrones Honestly, nothing. Watch Game of Thrones. If you haven't seen it yet, stop wasting your time following the Sinkerfield Cup or this show. Go there. Don't Game listen. of Thrones don't, Season don't, 5. Don't listen to this. Let, let's just go to the games. Because there was some tiny bit of fireworks in the World Champions uh, game. Magnus Carlsen, he is uh, on a roll. He started with a loss against Topalov, one uh, against Karijuana. And now his next victim was MVL. Yes, sticking with the Game of Thrones team. Feels like in Game of Thrones, this is evil queen, Cersei, and she's been publicly shamed. And now it feels like she's back meaner than ever. And I have a, a feeling the same applies to Magnus Carlsen. He's been a bit shamed in the Norway chess tournament. And then he lost the first round in Sinkerfield. But now he's back one, two games in a row. Back with a vengeance. I would not bet against this guy. So you might, we might just see a fantastic streak coming up. Who knows, like the 7 out of 7 that Karana pulled off last year is hard to top, but we've seen Carlsen win, I don't know, 5 games in a row or 6 in a row during Vikings A. And, yeah, and I do think if you're world back. champion, you're the strongest player, a streak like 7 out of 7, you might be like, yeah, I won that too. Um, but you set your own goals, you set your own yeah, goals, you won beat he was every record. Very disappointed that he didn't get the 7 in a row during Vike. Like, yeah. He had, he had won, I think, six in a row, and then Ivanchuk played a drawing line against him with White, and I'm sure he wasn't happy about and that. And he was, he was upset. He even said, what can I do if my opponent plays like this? It's a fair question. That's why I try to play like that every time. <laughs> you there's are not much guy. you can do. So let's uh, look at the game. Absolutely. Knight f3. Excellent first move. It's, it's like playing d4, but without allowing the Grunfeld, which is why a lot of people do it against MVL, who is a Grunfeld expert. Knight f6, c4. Kelsen mentioned that in his last game he played g3 against MVL, but it ran into b5, so he was very eager to stop this b5 move by going c4. Might have been tongue in cheek, but of course c4 is a main move here. And the point is after g6, white doesn't go d4 allowing the Grunfeld, but he goes either knight c3 or g3 as Kelsen plays in the game. And now if you want to play d5, things are a little different. White hasn't committed his pawn to d4 yet or his knight to c3. So it leads to positions that are a bit more awkward to handle for the Grunfeld player. That's why MVL decides to go for this symmetrical English, I think they call it. I'm not sure if they call it that. What do they call it? I bet something symmetrical. Because it, uh, it is still symmetrical. symmetrical. And here, so you also see games with knight c3, knight c6, that it stays symmetrical for a while. But here, Carlsen decides to play d4. Yeah, that's the move I like as well. You break the symmetry and try to grab some space in the center. d4 takes, takes. Thousands of games have been played from this position. Knight c6 is a main move. Castles is also a main move. 
here, little subtlety, which all of those guys know, if white castles, black goes d5 and equalizes the game. So you have to be precise and start with knight c3, which leads to, well, a lot of theory. Queen c7 is one of the critical moves here, knight c6 is the other one. But remarkably, uh, MVL started thinking here already. I think after Carlsen's reply to Queen C7. Yeah, Queen C7 is a, an absolute main move. When the main line here is B3 and Black has this tricky move D5 with some nice tactical points. White can't take, Knight takes D5, Knight takes D5. If CD, there's a little Queen check, which is unpleasant. And if Bishop D5 has E6, the Bishop goes somewhere and Rook D8. And this pin is gonna cost a piece. So guys know that, and after b3, d5, there's a lot of theory, whatever, knight like db5 or castles. For those of you interested, check out Peter Svidler's video series where he covers this with, as a black repertoire. Also check out the games of Vladimir Kramnik and so on and so forth. Anyway, Carlsen, who likes to go his own way, goes for the move knight to d5 in this position. Bit of a sideline. Yeah, I just want to say you already told people to watch an entire season of Game of Thrones. They also have to get the DVD series and watch Chromix games. It's a lot of homework you're giving in just five minutes now. That is true, but I feel like we're not just here to entertain, but also to educate. We are educators, that is correct. I consider myself an educator and yeah, between the Swiddler series on the Grunfeld and Game of Thrones, there's everything you need to <laughs> there's know. There's everything you need to know in life. Absolutely. You can become a sex successful human being by just doing that. I think See, so. Knight d5, and here, this is where he took his pass, MVL, and he took on c4. Which I was very surprised about, because knight d5 has been seen quite a bit in the past as a bunch of games, for example by Alexander Grishuk, and I thought it was more or less common knowledge that queen c4 leads to an unpleasant position, while knight takes d5 is supposed to be fine. Mm -hmm. The line I like best, because I play this stuff with white and I spent way too much time I could have used on Game of Thrones, like trying to find some stuff for white here. But this is a little queen check, which I think is very clever, forcing bishop d2, queen b6, bishop c3, and now e5, that's how Grisha played. And I thought black is perfectly fine here, I've tried to make this work for white a bunch of times, always failed. So surprised MVL did not like that or did not know that, because he's a huge theoretician, he knows everything. Yeah, then he should know it, right? But especially if you play queen c7, that is a distinct move. Absolutely, and after queen c7, yeah, there's three moves, queen d3, b3, or knight d5. Maybe what he did is he did watch Peter Svidler's video series, and I checked Peter Svidler also does not mention that move. Oh, so, so it is... We can blame Svidler. Yeah. We'll have him on the show later and confront Ask him Ask him why this. don't you cover knight d5. What do you do all the time? It could also be that he just took there and he was just trying to remember the moves because that's also what grandmasters do, right? They they just, oh, grandmasters, every chess player, they, they just try to memorize the lines, see if I take this pawn, do I remember what comes next? Right. Well, yeah, the thing is, if you go knight d5, you can more or less play without knowing a lot of theory. Well, after queen c4, it's very committal, you end up with a isolated d pawn you give up the two bishops yep. and you really have to know what you're doing so especially if he didn't know the exact details i'm surprised he took here but also we are masters in being armchair generals and in hindsight had he drawn this yeah. game we would probably praise he's him like genius oh, to yeah. take on c4 <laughs> he simplified immediately and took carlson out of his territory blah blah that's why we're usually better at the the show afterwards instead of the predicting phase like we always at the end of this hour will predict uh, today's round but we're not so good at that i think we're Speak better for at yourself uh, i'm terrible at it not just not so good i learned from the worst so let's see he took on c8 yeah little trick here rook takes c8 you should not take on b7 as juicy as this might look because there's a little check yeah not pleasant Still, castles, I think there's alternatives here, but I don't want to share all my secrets. So castles is a proper move, knight c6, bishop e3. And this is not a position you want against Magnus Carlsen. You have structural weaknesses and you're gonna suffer. I hear that a lot. This is a position you don't want to have against Magnus Carlsen. 
Most He's, positions you don't want to have against Magnus Carlsen. You just want to not play Magnus Carlsen. Is that that's, the, that's too now, is there, is there something, uh, we talked about this, but can you recommend a position you would want to try to have against Magnus Carlsen? Should it be, uh, should you have an attacking position? Should you attack him? Um, yeah, checkmate him. Checkmate, that's the position you want to have. So if you ever play Carlsen, just checkmate him. He, he's really bad at yeah, being I think checkmated. Defending checkmate, he yep. really struggles. And but seriously speaking, well, the thing he does best is grind away in like slightly better positions where it's not, well, he can't calculate with anybody, but where it's not about crazy tactics, move by move stuff, knowledge, yeah. but just the feel for the game. And here he is like efficient warder. So knight c2, he's willing to give up the bishop pair to stabilize, takes, takes, queen e6. Black is only slightly worse, but it is significant and it doesn't go away. The white bishop is stronger, white controls the d5 square, while black can't really control the d4 square because of e3. So it's an unpleasant situation to be in. Knight d5 takes. I was wondering here, can you also do without giving up the b2 pawn? I think Carlson mentioned that. He was a bit critical of... If you played queen d2, for instance. If you yeah. have a good position, why not have it with your extra pawn? Or will you just pick up b7? No, you will pick up b7, but it's still an exchange of pawns, which exactly. should help the defender in theory. So I do think there's a point, and I think Magnus also mentioned that maybe you shouldn't have allowed the exchange of pawns. I'm not sure queen d2, maybe some bishop yeah. h6 down the line bothered him. But it was a very worthy alternative. However, knight d5. Can't be too bad to put your knight to the center. Bishop takes, which I think is correct, just exchange some material, rook b7. So the same thing, slightly worse, not a lot of hope for anything but a draw. Rook b8, rook takes, rook takes b8. e3, another nice quiet move, just taking control of the d4 square. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be in MVL's shoes here. Well, Carlsen said he um, was surprised that MVL played submissively. That he said, this game was on my terms. Right. And that is, that is a problem here. That's what you mentioned, the uh, position you don't want to have. Like, he could slowly improve his position. You, you feel it could last hours, but you will have constant pressure. Absolutely, yeah. This is, this is terrible suffering. Once again, I'm reluctant to criticize MVL too much because it's much easier Sad, yep. you shouldn't play like this with black against a world champion then actually. Yeah. <coughs> Playing with black against a world champion. And you know they say before you criticize someone, you should walk a mile in their shoes. It's that way, one. when you criticize them, you'll be a mile away and you have their shoes. <laughs> some nice some more, some more wisdom, yes. wisdom now. Let's see, so rook b2. This was a move I was impressed with. It's once again a very small move, a4, doesn't look like anything. But it wouldn't be my first instinct. My first instinct would be to activate the queen, go queen a4, something like that. Which is a lot worse, after I've checked it a bit. a4 is the right move and one factor is, I believe that this pawn could play a role in the future. And Especially with the bishop on, on g2. Exactly. It's powerful and that's what also makes him world champion. This stuff just comes natural to him. Well, I would struggle with a move like a4, I believe. I feel the only ones who would play a4 are uh, the world champion or total beginners who are like, my pawn is under attack, let's just move it forward. Maybe, or probably a lot of other strong players as well, but I think I wouldn't have played it. So a4, knight e7, knight f4, bishop takes, pawn takes. That's a big decision, right, to give up the bishop. It is, I guess it was kind of forced here. I'm not sure what else could you do. Queen d6, then you run into some yep. very nasty, nasty knight jumps and you just have to give up the yep. bishop on worse terms. So and take on. At least you double the white pawns. I don't know, the rook can become active. Still suffering. Queen b6, a5, some little tactics. Queen a5, queen d4 check is once again bad news. And queen c5 was played, queen takes d7, I think we tweeted, or someone tweeted, MVL managed to solve the problem of the isolated d-pawn by giving it up. But <laughs> Radical solution. Which sometimes helps, you don't have to think about how to yeah. defend your pawn anymore, you can free your pieces a bit, but a pawn is a pawn. 
famous line by Jan Gustafsson. I'm not sure I can take credit for that one, but I will anyway. So queen d3, and here Carlson pointed out, yeah. even though the computer also gives us move king g7, which was played, that this was the last chance to take this a pawn, which otherwise will become a huge pain in the game. Yeah, I like the variation, because you can also uh, take it with your queen, but that's uh, way uh, worse than taking with your rook, because of, I believe, queen d7. Or queen d4. Oh, I thought check. Giving up this diagonal. Maybe queen d7. Queen d7 first, and now uh, it's hard to find a good spot for the. But here you have king queen c5, and here you still control things more or less. This, and then maybe I'm a bit confused about that line. I think the problem with queen takes is check, and this queen is so powerful on this long diagonal. But at least you do have the. Yeah. So he sh should have taken with the rook, and then at least you're you uh, you're rid of the a pawn. Yeah, you're still gonna suffer. Like the computer gives some clever moves here, queen e two, and it's still problems for black. I don't know. Let's say king g seven, rook to d one, queen b two. The black king is weak, and you're still in some trouble. But at least, yeah, you don't have to deal with this guy anymore, which will play a role in the remaining events. Not unlike Jon Snow. <laughs> yeah, is that certain that he's dead? No, he's not dead. That's why I think he's gonna play. Oh, he's gonna play. All right. He's gonna be back. Spoiler. No, it's just my theory, and I tend to know this. Stuff. So Bishop B7. Now this pawn is. <coughs> Apologies. Safe, protected. This is a target. Game still ain't over because white is stuck defending this f2 pawn. Yep. It's very hard to activate. Black pieces are quite nice. And the next critical point we get somewhere around here after so queen to e5. The question is should you or should you not exchange queens? Which is again easy to ask that question in hindsight. But yeah, we, we, we agree that you shouldn't probably. Yeah, it looks like queen b6, just to keep the pressure on this f2 pawn and keep the f1 rook passive, was a better bet, which, yeah, is mainly informed by the fact that the end game did not offer that many chances. Black is still seriously worse here, but it did look like a better chance. Bishop to d5 is annoying, threatening queen e8 check. And once again, the game remains very much on Magnus Carlsen's terms, but yeah. after what was played, queen e5, f e5. The rest was a matter of world champion esque technique. Should have won. This pawn is dropping. MVL tried to create some counterplay by stopping King G2, locking up this bishop. But it wasn't enough. Oh. Rook D7, Rook here. Here the computers were saying A7, which also wins. Some people were critical of Carlson's move G4, but it's just a very good practical decision. He calculated one line, g4, knight h4, rook d3. Point being, you can't take because of check. And that pretty much ends the game. He's going to pick up this pawn. And then and it's two pawns. Two pawns are two pawns, and he's going to free his king. This monster remains on the board. So that's... Yeah, yeah it's, it's great that he, he just, as you said, he played a4, and that, that pawn was decisive. He just felt like that is the one that's going to bring me victory. Maybe he's psychic, that Carlsen guy. He can see into the future. Oh yeah, that would be a nice ability with chess. Yeah. Or maybe not. Maybe ju you just know <laughs> that like, you're gonna, you're gonna lose <laughs> or yeah, I'm not gonna win today and you're cranky all day. More wisdom from Game of Thrones. Everyone wants to know their future until they do. Wow. Let's let that sink in for a few minutes. A few minutes, a few seconds. Let's not let it sink in too long. Yeah. Great game. Do we have other decisive results? Um, I believe so. We do, right? You believe so? I believe in so. Uh, you believe so one. It's so hard to avoid Wesley so puns, right? Like normally <laughs> one doesn't do puns with the last name of a player, but like I never do so puns what? with Grishuk. Mm, Grishuk. No, no, Grishuk. He looked a bit. Or Nakamura. The... It's also diff difficult to pun with. Exactly. Let's have a look at Grishuk. Oh no, that's not Grishuk. Oh, that's Grishuk. There we got Grishuk. He didn't look like a happy camper. Oh, he almost look, looks disgusted in the picture at the left. 
picture at the left, yeah, that's a key moment. We're gonna to get to there where he put his pawn to f5 and things did go astray. But the other picture is from earlier and already there. He doesn't look too thrilled, does he? No, what, what is he looking at, you think? This first picture is the typical pose when, picture on the right, that is, when the player is trying to remember their opening preparation. You stare to your upper yeah, right and you, or upper left, I can't remember, and you're trying to recall something. Because the, the board is distracting, because there are pieces there, they don't move, so you have to look at something different. I think, I, I've once studied this, I always forget, but if you're trying to remember something, it's normal that people look to the upper left, because for whatever reason, that's that where part you of your brain the memory. Is, uh, yeah. Yeah. I also heard, uh, I don't know if you can confirm this, that people memorize lines uh, while staring at something, like at the ceiling, that when they are at home memorizing lines, they also do that, so that you create the same situation at the board, that it's easier to me remember that way. No, who has time for that? When I try to memorize lines, I just stare at my laptop and the lines <laughs> that are on the laptop. Anyway, Grishuk here, not a very happy camper. He was a bit happier earlier when he was checking out the Vichy Topalov opening, which by the way, we're not gonna cover that game. It ended in a draw, Vichy, after starting with zero out of two, he was playing it safe. And Topalov, after being a two out of two, he thought, yeah, let's settle for a draw with black and let's get uh, back to business today. Yeah, I think both guys were okay with the result, or I'm not sure they were okay, but that's what happened. Grishuk, yeah, very curious about the opening there. He's checking Topalov's score sheet. Maybe he's checking if Topalov wrote down like self-motivational notes on the score sheet. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, what So did, but he so is not doing that anymore. I no, mean. he's learned his lesson there after, yeah, I'm sure you guys heard the story, what happened to him at the US Championship where he lost the game because he wrote something down on his score sheet. Yeah, that was sad for everyone involved, I think. Probably not his opponent. Maybe No, even opponent. for his opponent. You don't want to win that way, I think. I want to win that way. You really want to win that someone else writes, come on, you can do this, and then you get a point? Is Absolutely. That you get the free feeder rating, no work involved. What a professional. Yeah, and the game. Let's see, it also started off C4, C5. Yeah, I'm so sick of all Yeah, what C4. is happening with C4? It's all over the place. People hate the Grunfeld. That's why you can't go d4. That's why we see all these one knight of threes and one c4s. Because people also hate the Berlin. So one e4 is also out of the question. Yeah. One thing we've seen a lot is knight of three, c5, and now e4. e4. Now that Berlin is out of the question. Yeah, and then it's a Sicilian, and they don't play the open Sicilian. They all play, play bishop b5. No, some guys do. Carlson is a bishop b5 guy, but there's a bunch of guys who go for the open Sicilian. Carana, Vichy. Well, not Vichy yesterday, because he was happy to He wanted to make a draw, so he played uh, Bishop b5. Yeah. Anyway, c4 in Grishuk's game. c5, no e5, knight of 3, knight c6, knight c3, knight f6. More symmetrical English, whatever it's called. d6, slightly different line than in the game we just saw. d6, the point is that you can go Bishop d7 early. Well, if you started with, well, let's say, Bishop g7, d4, takes, takes. Castles, castles, here you're not in time anymore to go d6 and bishop d7. So it's another very playable setup that Grishuk chose. I had this position once against Zoltan Almashi, I believe. I also played this. I was very panicky before the game and during the game about plans with h5 and h4, which aren't good, but they're scary. You think it shouldn't get too scary, you want to be in control. Or you want your opponents to just follow a nice, steady, positional path. I don't want to allow any of my opponents' pawns on the fifth rank. Like, I'm fine with them being on the sixth, sixth. rank, but on the fifth, they're already dangerously close so to you the just demarcation line. Them. Exactly. Yeah. Or it's suicide, like e5, e5. Like e5, that I can like. Yeah, but h5 is too dangerous. Did he play h5? No, he didn't. And I don't think it's a good move. I think it's too slow. I can't remember the details. We should be 2 h4. I'll take your first and then if bishop right. takes knight d5. It's right. good for white, but it's yeah. still scary. That could be nice for blitz games or things if you just play a three minute game. Absolutely. So Grisho played more naturally, takes bishop c6, castles, knight d5. Here, curiously, at least to me, because I'm such a bishop fanatic, he did give up the bishop 
on d5 for the knight. There were alternatives, like you could go knight e8, queen d2. Probably very obvious, but you shouldn't exchange knights. I don't know if that mistake uh, has ever occurred. Due to checkmate. I feel if there's an easy checkmate, let's just show it. Absolutely. Okay. So, but you could retreat the knight to e8, h4, to exchange the dark squared bishops. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're still slightly worse, actually. In these structures, more wisdom today. If one pair of minor pieces remain in these Marochi structures, white tends to be better because of the extra space. It's one of these situations where black doesn't really struggle finding squares for his pieces, so exchanges don't ease black's defense all yeah. that much. I once heard, is this uh, is this correct, that in a Maroxi bind, or positions like this, if all the minor pieces are on the board, white is better, and if only one minor piece on the board, white is better, but in between, like, three minor pieces each, black is better. Black is better is strong, but yeah, I think that rule of thumb more or less applies. So yeah, it's two each, but this knight is very dominant, so it's gonna have to get exchanged. Very and happy I could also say something educational. Yeah, congratulations. Thank uh, you, it's my no first uh, educational moment. How does it feel? Yeah, it feels great. It's so nice to teach those people some things. Yeah. yeah. They don't tend to listen. No? Please listen to what I just said. All right, let's continue. A bishop d5, and this is, this is nicer for white. Yeah, so... Grishuk follows your rule, wants to keep two pairs of minor pieces, mm -hmm. but now the structure has changed. Now it's no longer a Marochi structure, it's more of a, well, King's Indian structure. CD, Queen A5, I think all of this is reasonably solid for black. But he does have less space and white has the two bishops, so black has to be careful. Not fully sure where it went, where it went wrong for Grishuk. I'll tell you. Okay. Not yet. Still fine? Still fine. It, it is more pleasant for... Maybe this move. Just because the six. computer says it. <laughs> so suddenly we start believing computers, do we? Suddenly? Uh, <laughs> I don't believe <laughs> in anything else. the past 15 years. Yeah, yeah what, is, what is in general, what could you say? Because this is a position that occurs on many levels and many times. Like White has the bishop that is looking at its own pawn. So you could say, is it a strong or a weak bishop? Black has a knight that has some nice squares, like on e5 where it can be kicked by f4, but on f6 or c5 is usually square to go to. What are, in general, you feel like the plans that both sides should follow? What is white going for? What is black going for? I don't have the slightest clue. <laughs> I understand these positions all that well. It always depends on nuances. Like here, white is an active queen with, yeah, even the black queen was on b6. Then it's not so easy to get this in. Why does he use a space advantage? So a typical plan is to try to soften up the black king a little bit. Mm -hmm. By going h4, h5. And are there pieces you want to exchange for both sides? Like does Black wants to exchange stuff. He'd be thrilled to exchange both rooks, for example. Mm -hmm. And he'd be thrilled to exchange the queens as well. Because especially at a lower level, it often happens. Let's make some bad moves. Okay, this was actually a good move. <laughs> you just can't make bad moves even yeah, if you try it's, to. It's tough. Here, bishop a3 would be a good move to get rid of this knight. Yeah. Let's say this. See what you're getting at. I feel you want to exchange. This is okay. what you often see at a lower level where all of a sudden white gets stuck with a bad bishop. Black has this beautiful knight on yep. c5 and black would be better. So white has to avoid exchanges and losing control of the c-file. Use a space advantage to get something going. That's what Wesley so did. That's exactly what he... Uh, so Grishuk, yeah, follow that script, try to exchange a bunch of stuff, takes, takes, queen b4. So did not take queens here, because then you're in danger of ending up in that endgame. Mm -hmm. And rook c4, queen e1, rook c7. And we see the first fruits of white's control of the c-file. The pawn might drop, still, there's a little trick, knight e5, threatening a check. But e5 is not the right square for the knight, would much rather be on c5. It wants to be on c5, yeah. King g2. Queen b4 back, same theme, offering the end game, but now it's all about details. Terms have changed. Now there's hanging pawns, so white is happy to go for this. Goes rook c2. There's no more hanging pawns, contradicting what I just said, but. Yeah, the c file later. is very important now. So you'll go, eventually you can go back there. Yeah, so rook c2 is clever because first he wants to kick out the knight from here, and then after knight d7, eventually he will invade and pick up. Right. Hmm. King 
king g7, f4, knight d7, king f3. Another good move. Bring your king to the center. And now, uh, question, he played f5. And yesterday you were very upset when Nakamura played f5. You also said it's a very bad first move for black, the Dutch defense. Can we just conclude that every time a black player plays f5, it's a bad move? I think that's a very fair... Not only rule of thumb, but a rule. Just don't touch your f-pawn, ever. Just leave it there, glue it, leave it to there. the board. If you want to help yourself. Yeah, in this situation, I'm not sure it was a decisive mistake or anything, but it did not help because after that, Grishuk just lost a pawn and never saw it back. He should probably have tried knight c5 here, going back to the good square. The reason this is not a good scenario for black, like the one I mentioned earlier, is the white king is very active and comes and this pawn is loose. Yeah, so you're going yeah, to c4, pick up b4. Yeah, still this was a bad chance. Now, well, you're not allowed to move this pawn, but if you were, now would be a bad time to go f5, then a move earlier. Yeah. So Grey Shook, yeah, probably wasn't, well, probably wasn't time trouble, because he tends to be. And after f5 takes, takes, rook c7, knight c5. Yeah, and he's back, uh, the rook is back in time to go to, uh, so we just have the same scenario without the e7 pawn. Yeah, that was a nice, nice maneuver. Yeah, and black, well, he did gain some positional pluses, but not quite enough. He can't attack the d5 yeah. pawn, the b4 pawn is still weak. So it's very close to hopeless here already. And so relentlessly, well, just improves his position, brings yeah. his king over. I feel he has a bit of that gift that he can win games where it looks like he hasn't done anything special. Is that what Wesley so does? Not yeah. always, but it, sometimes it feels like, oh, where did his opponent go wrong, or what was his star move? And yeah, Nothing really, but he just beat Grishuk. There's no, no particular blunder. Also, no real edge from the opening, but he just slowly... Yeah. He doesn't make mistakes. No, he's an interesting player. And then maybe so we can look at the final position, or maybe just click through the moves, because uh, Grishuk resigned, and I was wondering, is that too, too early to resign? Yeah, it's a typical thing. I believe he resigned here. Where players make the time control, no one ever resigns before the time control because no, there's time travel and there's emotion and happen. you don't know what's going on. If you saw it, Caruana Carlson. But now you sort of, yeah, calm down, have a quiet look at the position and you see it's hopeless. Or, well, he considers it hopeless. So he's just probably disgusted with what happened earlier and calls it a day. I'm, I'm not sure. I agree you could make some more moves, but well, I would, think would you resign? just lose. Would you resign in this position? Um, Probably depending I who you're playing. Know. Yeah, it always depends on the opponent and if you have plans things. afterwards. If you have yeah. a, a date to catch a meeting. If you have to go to a baseball game in St. Louis, you never know what you know. these guys are up to. No, but I feel. I, do you think all ten players in this uh, tournament would resign this position? No, I think the moment where you resign is, can be sort of arbitrary, but move 41 tends to be a very popular spot to <laughs> very do. Very popular resigning move. Also, uh, a move where m many people make a mistake, right? That you, that you made the time control, you have another hour, you think for 25 minutes, and they make the decisive mistake. I'm not sure if there's any evidence on that. I've heard, I've heard that story many times. So I think if one looked it up, I would still believe the blunder frequency is much higher on move 40 than move than 41. 41. That would be nice if anyone has still write his thesis on something about chess. That's a nice topic. Absolutely. There's a lot of data. Yeah, so, he, so yeah, you could make some more moves here. But you would lose. Promise King B6 is coming, attacking this pawn. The knight goes here. Sooner or later, King c7 will wrap things up, or bishop b5 followed by b4. Yeah, there was one nice line, right? If you go king c7 right away, black plays rook check, and you shouldn't take that pawn because of check, knight check on e4. But it's almost checkmate. Imagine the rook was here. Yeah, just imagine. Like this, yeah. Okay, why just screwed up? You but, can probably continue, but. But I mean, just moment. like if there, if there are things like this in a position, I know he has a lot of time, but. I feel there are still some chances, but that's No, you okay. could have checked out, yeah, at least this trick and <clears throat> continue. But I do think you would have lost 100 out of 100. Mm -hmm. And if, you, if that's the case, then you can resign. Yeah, that is, uh, that's definitely true. Someone is already asking us what our predictions are for today's round. 
Yes, uh, they're curious, even though we get it wrong every day so far, but that's an interesting question. Maybe shall we go there already or shall we just... No, we'll get to those in a minute with our boy Peter Swidler, whom oh. hopefully we will call in. Shall we try to get a hold of him yeah. and then quiz him about yeah, the, the, the opening World questions Champion game. we have? Exactly. Because in the, yeah, the World Champion game and also the Nakamura Karana, which we haven't touched on yet, this is another... Grunfeld. Grunfeld, Swidler home territory. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to call the guy and we'll be back with you in a couple minutes, maybe two minutes, maybe one minute. Don't go anywhere. Don't start a Game of Thrones episode. Just stay tuned. Get, get, maybe get a drink. That's nice. Get no, no, don't get a drink. Don't it's, hydrate it's too yourself. Early. Oh, we drink you think of alcohol right away. I thought that's what you were telling the audience. Get a good glass of milk. We'll see you in one or two minutes. Can't seem to get rid of it. Welcome back, everyone, with none other than Super Grandmaster and bearded man hipster Peter Swidler, who is with us to rant about Fabiano Carana not watching his Grunfeld series. Peter, how are you doing? Possibly, uh, it's not you know, it's not immediately obvious if, if that's true. I mean, maybe he did watch it and and found a refutation somewhere. That's... I'm not entirely sure. That's not great advertisement for your series, Peter. Which is why I was so upset when he played bishop takes b5. I mean, I thought, why would you do that? Let's I mean, go there. So, something. I mean, educate us. <laughs> the opening for queen b3, bit of an offbeat move. Why can't I get rid of this blinking Peter Swidler mini picture? It's very upsetting what? to everyone involved. No, I have a little screen in screen picture I can see of yours which keeps blinking away. But anyway, I'm just gonna apologize for it is. and promise I'll find it one day. I, I really don't know where it is. 
So now we're just joined by two Super Grandmasters, Peter's Fiddler and Peter's Fiddler mini version. Yes. Some like mini me version of Peter. The angel and the devil on your shoulder, except <laughs> the, the angel is not there, it's just one of them. So, Queen B3. Well, this I, I is mean, supposed. Go ahead. The, the idea, uh, as far as I could understand it, of, of doing it this way was uh, if black goes. Uh, according to normal lines if you take on c4 queen c4 bishop g7 e4 castles white can play bishop e2 here and uh, by doing that he dodges some of the options black has available to him if the knight is already on f3 so uh, this was supposed to be the reason why people uh, started with pin b3 and move 4 instead of move 5. yeah uh, but, but uh, but obviously it gives black additional options as well and uh, the, the major one is exactly what Fabiano did bishop e6 after taking on c4 and uh, this is what i recommended in my videos and uh, i mean it's been played at the very top level there was a game between Ivan ivanchuk and carlson so uh, it's not exactly unknown why can't uh, i grab the pawn i want the pawn well, I mean, if you go queen, queen b7, knight c6, knight c6 is very, very strong, so... Queen b7, you just take you on d4, and you win. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry, I was looking at queen b5 check, knight c6, queen b7, but then no, no, knight no, d4 no, does no, win. Queen, no, no, queen b5 check, you play, uh, you play bishop d7 anyway. Ah, okay. No, you play bishop d7, and, and if you take on b7 here, I play knight c6. Gotcha. And... Uh, Rook b8, knight b4 follows very, very fast, so you you will probably end up in a lot of trouble doing that. Don't want that. So he went queen a4 check, bishop to... Bishop d7, queen d3. D7, queen yeah, d3. regardless of where you, you give the initial check, this is the supposed main line. And black should reply c5, which is what Fabiano did. Uh, and here, d takes c5 leads to, uh, you know all other set of positions black has a number of options there which are all extremely playable and uh my my own suggestion in the videos has actually been played during the the, the russian high league which pleased me no end because it was a you know it, it, it's a it's a very funky suggestion and uh, i did not expect to see it on the board and uh, i'm quite happy that somebody got to play it after what is your D5. suggestion? And what, what's the suggestion? Now we're curious. After, after d takes c5, uh, knight a6, I think the, the stem game went bishop g7. Yeah, I think it was bishop g7, uh, and uh, then uh, play gets, you know, it, it looks normal. But after knight a6, the best move white has is queen a3, to which my proposed reply was rook c8, b4, and now knight b8, creating this threat of a7, a5. And uh, in my opinion, this holds. Uh, so, and this actually has been played uh, in a in a very interesting game between uh, Evgeny Nairov was white uh, in the in the Russian super final against uh, uh, I think David Parayan, uh, a young guy, who I'm going to make an assumption that he's watched the videos because. He, he, I mean, it's not an idea that you cannot find on your own, but it's just such an obscure position that I just somehow assume that uh, I have I have uh, people who have actually seen <laughs> seen what I had to say, which is a, a pleasant feeling. <clears throat> Mixed blessing. Now they all know the Grunfeld secrets. In case you haven't seen it yet, go check out Peter Svidler's series. Do you gain some pleasure from retreating a knight to b8? Like, my favorite move is knight d7 to b8, intending to go knight c6. Do you have the same feeling? Well, I mean, as a Spanish player, I tend to play knight c6, b8, intending to go knight d7 more than the other I way know, around. Of course. <laughs> yeah, but... Uh, no, I mean, the whole the whole idea of... Yes, I mean, first you make some active moves, and then you put it back, sort of, you... You, you make a move which doesn't seem to be, you know, progressing your course particularly, but it, it actually creates... Uh, rather serious counterplay on the queen side. I, I thought the whole idea was very attractive from, from an aesthetic point of view, and also it seems to work, which I think is a, is a big added bonus. Absolutely. 
So in the game, c5, d5 was played, the critical move, and now b5. That's also the yeah, move you like, right? That's how you're supposed to react there, I think. Uh, because now queen takes b7 is actually a huge threat because you don't have any knight moves and the rook on a8 will be in terrible danger. So you do need to, have to, to react somehow to this threat. And uh, this actually has been known since the, since the 1930s. I think the stem game is 1936 between Smyslov and Ragozin, if I'm not mistaken. And now you said you were uh, surprised by bishop takes b5. Yeah, but after knight takes b5, I mean, the most obvious thing in the position is to give a check, drive the knight back to c3, and play something like knight a6, intending rook b8 next move. And uh, positions arising from that, uh, I, I mean, I've, I've looked at them in, in reasonable depth. I, also, I, I think I also lost uh, with Wise starting from this position against Boris Gelfand in the match we played against each other in Jerusalem uh, in last year. I think uh, after knight a6 I started with f3 instead of queen d1 and uh, uh, the game lasted about 20 moves. So black does get a tremendous tremendous amount of play there and I was very very curious as to why Fabiano decided not to do that. Do you feel like if Fabiano had a manager that was maybe familiar with the material published on the site both things could be avoided? If only, yeah. But, you know, some things cannot be helped. No. I think, yeah, there's just too much information out there. Maybe he did watch it and forgot, or maybe he no, but thought... It, to, to be honest, my feeling is uh, they probably found something there, but I'm not quite sure what, because, as I said, I mean, I've spent, uh, not only for the videos, but only for myself, I've spent some time looking at this, and uh, I'd be very, very curious to know why they, uh, I mean, Fabiano and... Uh, his, his team, why they chose to go bishop takes b5. But maybe, I mean, one possible explanation uh, could be that, you, you know, if you go for this line with black, you're kind of expected to play queen a5 check. And uh, if, let's say, they came to the conclusion that queen a5 check is playable, but so is bishop takes b5, uh, bishop takes b5 has a, a big advantage of being a move people probably haven't analyzed uh, deeply. And, you know, if Hikaru goes for this line, he probably has something after d5, b5, knight takes b5. Right. So it makes sense to play something uh, new. I'm, and uh, Fabiano got a perfectly presentable uh, position after, after out of the opening, so he can't really fall. I mean, his choices were perfectly, perfectly okay. It's just that for me personally, it was very, very curious to see uh, if there was anything wrong with my conclusions. And how does it work? Would you ever just call him up and ask, or is that not done? Uh, with, with some people you might, with Fabiano we're not that close, I mean, I don't think, I mean, I could try, but I don't think I will get much of anywhere, but <laughs> with, with some people uh, it's potentially possible in some cases, yes. Very secretive, these super grandmasters. Yeah, like, yeah, it makes sense. Cause it's your livelihood, the information. Yeah, that is, uh, that is true. Mm. Still, he did get a fine position, right? After knight bd7, let's make some more moves. Knight a3, I'm not sure about that one, knight b6. Here I thought, at least practically, black's position must be maybe even easier to play and very nice, right? Yeah, I thought I thought it's a perfectly perfectly nice position to be to, to, to play with black because you have, uh, you know, a great amount of play for, for, for the sacrifice pawn. And uh, it's white, who has, I mean, as a white player in a position like this, you have to constantly sort of ask yourself, am I better or should I already think about maybe equalizing somewhere? you know, bailing out by trading some pieces and equalizing into some kind of a, you know, level endgame. And and for black, I mean, you just increase your initiative, you play against the, you know, you have open files on the queen side to use. And uh, yeah, I, nothing wrong at all with uh, how Fabiano uh, played the opening in that game. Any spots that caught your attention later in the game? It looked to me like Nakamura defended well and we were sort of headed yeah, there towards were, the draw, right? Uh, there was a very curious spot uh, at some point. I, I thought I, I'd, give a, I'd give the official broadcast a chance, uh, and uh, I watched uh, the three of them discuss the position somewhere around the three rooks, e4, queen, d2, rook, b4. And there was a very beautiful uh, tactical idea there somewhere, but uh, I don't think it materialized on the board, actually. So. Can you recall uh, it after rook b4? Mm -hmm. uh, after rook b4, I think the line went rook b1, knight c4, queen d5. 
and in this position there is a very very beautiful move queen f8 apparently uh, which uh, prevents knight g5 sort of uh, protects the f7 pawn in advance and creates a very very unpleasant threat, threat of rook d8 which will uh, lead to all kinds of forks i mean rook d8 followed by knight d2 in most cases but also in some positions rook d8 followed by knight e5 because the queen more or less has to go to c6 after rook d8 but there was a very very beautiful geometrical motif there which uh, uh maurice and his machine pointed out but nakamura wisely avoided that when rook c1 more active and he even got some chances later on i believe yeah later, machine... on, later on uh i was basically i i stayed up barely because i'm still sort of half on moscow half on chita time and uh, uh somewhere around midnight um, my body starts sending me confusing signals as you know he, part of me thinks it's midnight part of me thinks it's 5 a.m and i somewhere around that point i feel i probably should go to bed so i i stayed up to to see how the time controls w w will work out and then i i finally went to bed and uh at that point it was four against three on uh, on the king side and i expected this game to last forever and in in the morning i checked and basically it looked completely equal by move 48 or so and uh, i couldn't really understand the decision to break up your structure the way uh hikaru did and create a weakness on g5 which play could, uh, so then if we, so from move 40 so when you went to bed you thought uh white had better chances chances obviously well, I mean, because he is a pawn up well, it should be it should be a draw objectively, but uh, I thought you know you can sort of uh, you can expand gradually on the king side, try and keep keep black from exchanging too many pawns, and you know uh, always uh, you hint at play against the f7 pawn, so black can't get too active, black can't really leave the seventh for very long. So you have a you have this setup, and you can try playing I don't know king g2 f4, king f3, e4, e5. Obviously, you know, Black will have something to say about that, but I expected that game to, I expected that game to last for longer than it did. Although, I mean, I I, I thought Fabiano would hold, but I did not think he would hold with such ease. I thought it was a dead draw. Okay. But you think G five was too soon? Because the, the next move he played, a move uh, forty one, was G five, and you would have waited, advancing one of your pawns that far. I haven't actually even seen G4. I may have left before move 40 in that particular game. I mean, when, when I left, the pawn was still on G3, which is uh, <laughs> where I thought it might want to stay for a bit. By the way, when you say you're still half on cheetah time, does that mean you've adapted to the sleeping habits of a leopard? Or what does that mean? Nice one. I have, I have no comeback to that. <laughs> Cheetah is a place where the Russian championship was played, which has like six hours difference or something, right? Five, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, just checking. Are you, because sure. you, you play so many tournaments all over the world, are you getting used to the jet lags or is it is it always hard? Well, I mean, it, it depends, but generally going east is slightly trickier than going west and five hours is quite a, quite a bit. But isn't the problem coming back after going east? I feel like going there is fine, but then when you come back, it's hard to... I mean, b both are... Generally speaking, I mean, two hours either either direction is fine, but once, once, once you get to those, you know, Chinese differences, you know, that is where trouble might start. So is it also when you play a tournament somewhere far away, do you always go a few days in advance just to get accustomed well, to the... Well, you do, but I don't think, you know, it, it's arguable how productive that is, because I think the worst days are not actually days two and three. For me, it's always somewhere around day four or five. So what you do by uh, doing that is you kind of uh, make it fall more or less exactly on round one or two instead of round two or three when you may have played yourself into some kind of form otherwise. Yeah, I heard Olympic athletes when the, the Olympic Games or the World Cup was in Australia or something that some go a month in advance, like runners that they just take an entire month. That's a luxury, of course. Yeah, well, I mean, if you can if you can do that, that works. Yeah, but uh, not many people can. That's definitely true. It's tricky if you have a tournament every two weeks and you're always trying to be a month in advance. You, you really have to calculate every tournament. your schedule. It's gonna be tough. And um, moving on, yeah, this game ended 
in a draw, not that much excitement over there. What's anything that surprised you about the first three rounds? Topalov, two and a half out of three. Karana and Anand, half out of three. What stood out to you? Well, it's uh, it's hard to say. I mean, yes, Topalov had a fantastic start, but we know he can. And uh, I mean, I just enjoy watching them. I, I, I can't say something shocked me in particular. I mean, Vicious start was a bit of a... Uh, a bit of a bummer in Fabianos as well, obviously, but uh, mainly I just feel it's, you know, it's a great spectacle for anyone who who likes the game and I just, you know, I, I watch the, the, these tournaments as a as a spectator with uh, great joy. So diplomatic. I'm always trying to get him to talk some trash. It's it never happens. It's not really. It's not Sammy. really me being diplomatic. I, I honestly think that, you know, in a field like this, more or less anything can happen and uh, also, you you are more or less guaranteed to get get your uh, get your share of excitement. Uh, these are very very nice tournaments to watch. I'm I'm not being I'm not hedging or you know dodging the question. It's just uh, how I feel about them. And do you expect a lot of excitement for uh, today's round? We have Grishuk Topalov, Karuana Anand, Vasile Graf Nakamura, Giri Carlson, and So Aronian. Well, I mean, every round should be should be good. I mean, uh, once again, I really, really hope to to avoid the prediction game. But I mean, what's not to like? <laughs> not gonna happen. Let's get into the prediction game. Our boy Grishuk, who I know you're good friends with, with White against Topalov. That's in Norway. Chess Grishuk played a sharp line against him, then lost a piece early on and lost that game. Yeah, that was that was a bit of a disaster. But before I think he had a good score with White against Topalov, I have a feeling he can beat him. And Topalov, he's not the type to play for no, a draw with can Black Eagle, right? Exactly. I mean, uh, Sasha is definitely a player who, when he plays well, he he can win in any game he plays. So, even against Vishyanand, after 15 years, yeah. he beat him for the first time here. Yeah. So we agree they both can beat anyone. Karana with White against Anna. That's an interesting one. Both half out of three. Yeah, that that will be that will be interesting. I think for Fabi will try to press, but uh, I mean against Vichy, a lot depends on how the the opening comes out. And how do you because press against Vichy? He knows everything about everything, right? Precisely, but you know sometimes you get a position where you can still do something. I mean, uh, whether you do it by playing d4 knight of six bishop f4, or whether you do it by playing some kind of normal Catalan and then just making moves, sometimes this happens. Right. What else but we I mean, got? If, if Vichy gets a completely comfortable position out of the opening, I don't think much can trouble him. Mm, trying Regardless to of how many points he has. Use my excellent screen design skills. Oh, here we got the pairings, and here we got Blinking Peter's Fiddler again. So we also have MVL against Nakamura. Another exciting game. It's all good games. Yeah. Well, it. it, it... Hikaru seems to be reasonably solid in this event, and uh, Maxim is. Uh fluctuating somewhat wildly or at least that's you know a, a potentially you, that's not quite true though i mean it, just the fact that he had two decisive games one he won and one he lost that's not really fluctuating he he lost to magnus with black it can happen but well yeah that one is harder to call with Maxim, I feel a lot depends if he gets in some sharp opening preparation or if he's a bit surprised. Like, it applies to everyone, but especially Maxim, he has very pointed computer preparation, like the game he won against Levon during Norway chess. He just crushed him in the opening, and then Topalov surprised him, and he got crushed. I feel like he fluctuates more yeah, than I the mean, others. With him, with him, it's... Uh... Yeah, he, he, he does tend to go for sharp, uh, unbalanced positions, and uh, also he he works on on chess quite a bit. So, I mean, once again, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but uh, it, it it's much much easier to try and predict what will happen after you've seen the first thirty minutes, or maybe even ten in many cases. So we should really move the prediction game to uh, 15 minutes from the start of the round. That might actually be a good idea. I did that once. I sent in my I predictions think, think three improve, hours in, and I got them all We wrong. would improve our results as pundits drastically if we could do that. Yeah. yeah. 
And what about Gary Carlson? Um, I'm going to say this is going to end in a draw. Oh. Giri famously never lost to Carlson, and he's not draw been is, overly shy about mentioning draw, that. Draw is not a loss. Yeah. So I'm not I'm not predicting he will uh, finally lose this uh, fantastic record against the world champion. But I think uh, now that Magnus, uh, you know, got uh, got his tournament back on track, I think. Uh, I mean, he'll be he'll be fine, but uh, I also don't think that you know Anish with white is in much danger. Fair enough. Someone should have told me a draw is not a loss earlier, and I would have developed a less reckless yeah, this, style. That, maybe that, that was one of the very very early earliest things that you know a top player told me. I, I played a Groningen Open in 1990, and uh, the, I, 90, 1990, yeah, and I met uh, Lev Sakis there. And uh, he told me, young man, one thing you should always remember, draw is a positive result. <laughs> Timeless I, wisdom. It set me back years, but... Uh, <laughs> but and still, you weren't playing him at that moment, memories. right? What? You weren't playing him at that moment, right? No, 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 no. We were just playing in the same turn. Or in actually maybe at the same venue. He probably was playing the round robin. I can't really imagine him playing the open in 1990. He's a bit of a forgotten guy, but no, not forgotten. But I'm not sure people are aware of how strong he was. He was like Russian champion and battling it out with Kasparov, Soviet champion and battling it out with yeah, Kasparov. Yeah, he was. Uh, in terms of pure gift, he was sort of on Kasparov's level. Exactly. By, oh, wow. By most assessments at the time. Maybe Kasparov hadn't taken this "a draw is not a loss" lesson as much to heart as Sachs. <laughs> yeah, that, that that is possible. Uh, Lev was always a very uh, mild-natured and you know kindly person. He wants to Possibly upset me. him back years as well. <laughs> Squeezing me to death in like 80 moves in a Catalan was one of the most unpleasant games I ever played. Oh, wow. But he's a nice guy. Anyway, one more to go. So against Aronian. I don't know what to expect there. Yeah, with Wesley, you don't you don't really know which Wesley will show up. But uh, I think you know after the the, the the sort of the bad Wesley and the good Wesley t today, uh, the, the safe bet will be on on a on a sort of middle Wesley, and uh, and then he. I mean, with White, nobody should be in danger with White in this tournament. So once again, I mean, I'm I'm going to be I'm going to be taking the safe route here. So you're predicting five draws as always? Yeah, we could do this much shorter. I'm, I'm saying we should move this to nine, ten Moscow time. <laughs> All right, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk then. Thanks a lot, Peter Svidler. Any closing words? Any more wisdom you want to share? Draw is not a loss. Loss is not a win. Uh, no, I think I'm all out. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. And we'll yeah. wrap it up for today. There's yeah, still a bunch of hours left till sink a field. Peter, are you going to stay awake to watch all the games? Uh, watch some of all the games, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure I will be capable of staying up until everything finishes, but I will try. It gets better every day. Hopefully we'll have some good fights, fights that end before the time control. That will be nice for you. Yeah, that would be excellent. Thank you, sir. Talk to you soon. Sure. Cheers. Oh, I clicked him away before he could say cheers. Yeah, he, he was in the middle of saying the word cheers, but at cheer, you decided to uh, send him away. Maybe he wanted to say cheetah. He seems to really oh, yeah. like that word. Or he possible. was starting a very long sentence. Yeah. But, uh, well, I think uh, that's our... Uh, that's a show. That's a show. Uh, we have four hours left, so uh, enough time to... Get some food, do some other things, and then watch we're ready. Like four episodes of Game of Thrones, and then you can watch some chess back to back. Thanks a lot for watching. See you next time. See you. Bye -bye. Take care. Good day.